tuned in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. Welcome back to another wonderful edition of the Devon and the Duke podcast. This is a limited edition series hosted by your main man, Duke Loves Wrestling. And of course, the Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all times. And let me say this, the entrepreneur. This man has his hands in a whole lot of different cookie jars here. And, and all it is is just making money. And life is sunny. Mr. Devon Dudley. How you doing there, Devon? I'm good. Not bad. Not bad at all. Tired as all hell, but good. <laughs> I, I was going to say, man, you're going to have to clone yourself because you got so much going on, brother. I don't even know how you find the time for it. Between the kids, the business, the wrestling, it's, it's crazy, man. I saw a post on uh, your Instagram Testify Devon, by the way, folks. If you're not following Devon on Instagram, you need to. Some really, really cool stuff that he posts and reposts on there every single day. But I saw a post about uh, your detailing business. So so tell me about this here, because this is not something we've ever revealed on the show before. Devon Dudley has a car detailing business? Yes, it's a mobile detailing business. I went into business with a friend of mine I was in high school with. And uh, he came up with the idea of doing it. He he loves cars. He he, like I like wrestling. He loves detailing and doing all that stuff. So what we find is a headache. He finds is pleasure. So he enjoys doing that. And he came up with the idea of starting in Fort Lauderdale, making his way up up into Orlando area uh, with a mo- with a mobile um, detailing business, and I. At first, I was a little hesitant, and then finally he convinced me on some things, and I said, all right, let's do it. We started off with using some of the boys, Sasha Banks, Zach Ryder, um, you know, Charlotte Flair, um, uh, uh, Mar- Marina uh, in AEW. Um, oh, yeah, Marina Shafir, yeah. Marina Shafir, yep. Ronda's a uh, good friend. Um there's a lot of other people that forgive me. Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Green, we do her cars. Um, we, a lot of the guys and girls in, in wrestling, we do their cars. Um, oh, God, I'm, I know I'm missing a lot more of the names, uh, and it'll come to me. But we started doing it with the boys, and then all of a sudden we ventured out into, um, you know, regular people. And it really hit big time. Court corporations, uh, things like that. So we go as far as Miami, all the way up um, to Winter Park. Wow, wow! So, so if if I had a uh, too much of a good time over the weekend, and my car is 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 not uh, not smelling the way that it needs to smell because you know we, we were having too much of a party and good time, what have you? You mean to tell me? that your detailing company will come to me if I'm in if I'm in the Miami area, let's say, and y'all will get me fixed up, right? Oh, absolutely. You won't be disappointed, that's for sure. Wow. Wow. See this folks, this man now now what's the name of the of the company there, Diva? Uh it's 3D Auto Detailing. And it's again, you can find it on Instagram and as well as um as Facebook. You know, we do everything that you can imagine. And there's no problem big enough that we can't take care of. Wow. That is awesome. That is awesome. Folks, uh, on Instagram, it's three, the letter D. So 3D underscore automotive, the whole word there, underscore detailing. So definitely check it out on Instagram, get more information, uh, taking a look at some of the the finished product here, which is pretty cool. And, And just like you said, Mercedes Monet. She is the second photo on the Instagram page there, and, and she's standing behind a uh, shiny vehicle there. It looks brand new. So that's it. You said the boss gave a <laughs> call, so I had to report for duty. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Man, you just don't stop. You know, you got the detailing thing. 
the cigars are going through the roof. In, in fact, you were recently at an event uh, with some some wonderful ladies uh, giving some information about your, your new brand of cigars, right? Yeah, basically it was um there was a it was the first cigar lounge that I had ever gone to uh here over here in Melbourne and it's called Executive Lounge. And there's a young lady uh that works behind the bar that I became good friends with where she came to me and asked me, she said, Would you mind coming to speak to a women's group? And things like that. And I was like, Absolutely, I'll do that. And you know, tell them about my backstory and how everything has transpired for me uh in my life and it worked. It worked out really, really well. Uh, started, you know, talking about the cigars and all of that. Everybody was really eager uh, and couldn't wait for it to come out. And it was one of those things where, you know, I was happy to have done uh, the speaking engagement, and I'll be doing a lot more with them. Um, you know, it, it's just one of those things where you get the word out about the cigars and things like that. It's all about connections, and that's what you have to do. You have to make connections, and that's what that's what we do. That's what we do for sure. And, and listen, you know, one of the best parts about doing this, this uh, podcast series with you here, Devon, is just the fact that we are building a wonderful community. A very high percentage of women listen to the show, which I'm very proud of and I appreciate because that's something that even on the Duke Loves Wrestling show, it, it's been like that for a number of years. So the fact that we can do that here on Devon and the Duke is really cool. So the fact that you are partnering with a um, women's group in a, in a cigar lounge where women feel comfortable there and they can partake and enjoy themselves and let loose. The fact that they wanted Devon Dudley to come and speak to them is so wonderful. And that is a testament to uh, the, the great businessman and human being that you are. So it's really, really cool. Now, I got to ask you the question, though, for anyone who hasn't tried it yet. How are the cigars? You got this line of cigars with Natura Cigar Company. How are the Devon Dudley cigars? Well, they're doing good. I just got a couple of samples that I'm going to be bringing on the road with me. Uh, I'll be in Mannheim uh, Comic Con, or Mannheim Con, I should say, uh, in Pennsylvania this week. I'm going to bring a couple of these samples with me uh, and pretty much just giving them out to some of the people that want to try to smoke cigars and let me know how you like them. Um, they're doing great and, you know, I'm loving everything about it. The advertisement has been very, very good. Uh, Fairway Cigar, um, has been really, really doing a great job in promoting this and, and really getting it out of there. Just met with the guy from Columbia who came down, uh, who's doing the cigars as well, uh, wrapping it and doing all of that. We, um, basically had a great conversation, uh, the other day and, uh, basically really, really excited about how this is going to really, really, uh, you know, be launched and, and things like that. So we're looking forward to everything that's going on right now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, man. I'm so proud of you. I mean, you, you got your bobbleheads, you got, you got your face on cups, you got cigars, you got the car de- detail and business. I mean, Jesus, Devon Dudley is in demand. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, I mean, thank God. How does it feel? Seriously, man, because you know, you're, you're somebody who, your bump card is not filled yet. You definitely still got some gas in the tank, but you know we, we're on the other side of that. We're, we're winding down a little bit here. The fact that in 2024, Devon Dudley is in this much demand where people legitimately, anything that you're associated with, they want to be a part of and they want to check out and they're interested in. How does it feel to, to, to still matter to this degree so much in 2024. I mean, it's great. I mean, you, you know, you're talking about 33 years and, and the brand is still going, still going strong. I am um, very happy about that. And, you know, it's through the grace of God that, you know, that is happening. So very happy, very content with that. And I'm just grateful. Well, I'm grateful, too, because I, I've been privy to some information. And I know that, uh, you know, as good as 2024 has been, 2025 is going to be an even bigger year for the entire Devon Dudley brand and everything associated with it. So, you know, brother, you just, you keep going, man, because you're making it work. And, and more importantly, you're showing others, you're showing your peers and you're showing folks who are younger in the business and, and, and who are coming up what's possible. All these years later, you could still find ways to make money, diversify your portfolio and remain relevant. 
You know what I mean? Which, which is really, really cool. So again, kudos to you on that. Speaking of relevancy, hot off the presses, folks, this is legitimately one of the craziest things that you could ever hear. And she didn't just do it once. This is the second time that she's done it. Somehow, some way, the great Linda McMahon has officially been named to a presidential administration for the second time. But instead of running the small business administration, she will now be heading up our Department of Education for the United States of America. This is incredible news. Linda McMahon, as we know, uh, part of the great McMahon family that created the WWF, what we call WWE now. At one time, she was actually president of the WWF. She is someone who is well-regarded and well-respected for being on top of things. She knows her stuff. You know, whether we're talking in pro wrestling or whether we're talking politically, uh, just in general. Linda McMahon is somebody that people have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for. In fact, I got to be honest, I've never heard anyone say anything negative about this woman. And it's it's interesting because not too many people can can uh, maintain that level, that degree of respect across the board like Linda has, and quite frankly, like you have, Devon. So I definitely want to get your thoughts. What are your thoughts on Linda McMahon being named Secretary of Education for the United States of America? I think it's great. Linda is a phenomenal lady. Uh, like you said, there's not a bad thing said about her. Um, she's got a great heart. She's got a great mind. I mean, Vince was the, how do I say this? Vince was the mind behind the storylines and things like that of the WWE. But Linda was the brain of the corporation that kept the deals going and things like that. So Vince wouldn't have to worry about that and only concentrate on building his brand from the inside. So to have Linda doing that, I think is tremendous. Um, you know, again, I love I, I love Linda very much so in terms of, you know, the way she is, conducts herself and carries herself. She's always been spot on. She's always been very kind, um, very witty, very just outgoing with people. I mean, she's definitely the type of person that you would want to do business with. And she's definitely someone um, that you could be proud to say that the position that she has, she's going to do a great job at it. So I love the fact that she's taking on that responsibility and doing that. And, and I, only the only person I think that would be fit enough to do that would be Linda. So congratulations on, on that. I'm sure I'm going to have to say congratulations on all your success moving forward because it's going to be exactly that, successful. Yeah, no question about it. She She's going to continue to knock it out of the park because that's been her track record. That's just who Linda McMahon is. And, you know, there are folks out there, and, and I understand it. I get it. As someone who has spent the majority of their career working in some form of government, I understand this us versus them, this, this you know, bloods and crips, red and blue, and all this other nonsense here that people feed into. But, folks, at the end of the day, we're talking about human beings. And as wrestling fans, the fact that somebody from this world, whether, whether you're a Hall of Famer like Devon Dudley, who worked closely with Linda, or whether you're just a lifelong fan like me, to be able to see somebody from this world achieve so much. I mean, legitimately, she's the most successful person politically in the history of pro wrestling. No question about it. And it's fascinating to see. You know what I mean? So it just goes to show this whole pro wrestling thing ain't so bad. And there's a lot you can make of it. You just heard Devon talk about all his different businesses and things like that. We're talking about Linda McMahon, who, again, this is her second appointment in a presidential uh, administration. How many people can say that? Uh, so, you know, definitely kudos to her and, and, and kudos to the entire wrestling industry, which gets taken even more seriously because of people like Linda McMahon. So that's that's a major win there. Um, Devon, you worked with Linda in the WWE. So I, I'm going to pick your brain about this because people were blown away when you talked about the fact that you produced those um, the 24-7 title segments with R-Truth and Reggie and, 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 and what have you there. So 
let's talk a little bit about Linda. How was it working directly with her? And, and, and do you have any specific stories that stick out where it's like, man, this is really cool to experience this with her? Well, you know, when the Attitude Era was forming and it was it was already getting started and it was going the way it was, you know, Linda was a big part of that. And as the Dudley boys started to grow and started to be put into more challenging roles, um, even with the McMahon family and things like that, there were segments where the Dudleys did things with Linda. I was very excited about it, you know, and it really worked really, really well. Um, I wasn't, believe it or not, I was a little intimidated <laughs> by it because, you know, it was Linda McMahon, you know, um, coming from the small world, I should say, of of the wrestling indies and then going to ECW. And during all of that time period, I knew who Linda was and Linda was already on TV. So it was kind of like, you know, seeing Vince for the first time, you're like in awe. And it was the same thing I felt about Linda because I had a lot of respect for Linda. And like they said in the documentary, Linda didn't really care to be in front of the camera, but when you asked her to do it and given the opportunity, she did it and she did it well. You know, and so to be able to work with her in that forefront where we've done things um, promo wise in the ring with her and things like that, it was really, really cool to, to do that with her. And the respect she had for me and Bubba was just it was great. It really was. There was one incident that I remember where we weren't working together, but she was very kind and considerate when we did the TLC match. um in Raleigh, this was the this was the, the the one that was considered the first one because the one at WrestleMania was a ladder match. This is the one where I was hanging twenty feet up or thirty, however many feet I was up hanging with Jeff, and I never we never told anybody about the bump that I was going to take because we were scared that it was going to get scratched, and I remember we were all saying that, and so the bump where I'm hanging with Jeff. And I, you know, let go and hit the mat from how from how many many feet up we were. I remember coming through the back, and Linda grabbed me, and she said, "Are you okay?" And I said, "Yes, I'm fine, thank you." I said, "Why?" She was like, "That was a hell of a bump you took. Good God!" She was like, "When I saw you take it, I cringed." She was like, "I could not believe you fell from that height." I, and I, I, I played it off. I was like, "Oh." It was nothing. <laughs> and she laughed. And she says, okay. <laughs> she said, you sure you're okay? I said, Linda, I am fine. Please don't worry about it. I am fine. Meanwhile, I'm dying inside because that bump hurt. But I wasn't going to let Linda know that, you know? So um, that showed me a lot because she didn't have to pull me aside and ask me. She could have just asked me one time and walked away and that's it. Or she didn't have to ask me at all. But she did. And I always felt grateful for that because it showed that she cared. She could have easily turned her back, went to talk to Vince or somebody else and didn't have to say anything to me in the back, but she did. So I was very grateful for that. And um, that's one of the memories that sticks out with me with Linda. That's deep. That's deep. And and I'm noticing a, a consistent pattern because ironically, the way that you speak of Linda is similar to how you speak of Stephanie McMahon and, and, and Triple H and Vince and what have you. These folks are actually pretty good to you. Yes. Um, Vince was phenomenal. Again, I get what he's going up against. The the trial that was postponed, that's, I guess, going to be coming soon. And all the alleged allegations, and I say alleged because he has not been proven guilty. So alleged allegations, you know, it's to me, he he was just he was a, he was great. He he helped me with you know he helped me buy this house I live in. He helped put my kids through college. I mean, he really did wonders for me, and I'll always be grateful for that. Um, you know, the whole McMahon family was good to me. I can't stress enough. And then of course, you know, I give praises to Triple H because it was Hunter that actually gave the idea of me becoming a producer after Bubba and I had left the company as talent. So, you know, I've got, I don't have a bad thing to say about anybody uh, in that company. I, 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 I'm very grateful for what they all did for me and how they helped me out and how they protected me over the years. It just, when it just seemed like 
um, it was over, somebody in that family always said, no, nope, you got another job to do. Stick around, kid. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and that was it was great. You know, I remember leaving the arena after my last match. I'm sorry. It was a Monday Night Raw. I was leaving the arena, um, and I bumped into Triple H. And he goes, hey, Devon, he was like, I think, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm, I won't let you down. And he goes, no, I know you won't. He's, Have you spoken to Stephanie? Have you seen Stephanie? I said, no, I didn't. And I remember shaking her hand and she shook my hand very firmly. And she said, I'll see you soon. Right. And she gave me that look. And I just went, yes, you will. <laughs> you know, I said, yes, you will. You'll see me soon. And I will never forget that. She stopped mid-conversation to who she was talking to just to say that to me. And that just showed me a lot on her behalf. Um, and I was very grateful for that. So, you know, again, the whole McMahon family, I, I, I just can't stress enough how grateful I am for them, for the opportunities that was given to me. And, um, you know... The sky was the limit, and they let me reach that sky many times. You know, we're, we're experiencing something very interesting in our society right now here in the United States. And I can't speak for the rest of the world. I know that a lot of things mirror each other and what have you. But here in the United States, we're, we're experiencing something interesting where the whole notion of thinking things are one way because you're being told they're one way. And then finding out that it ain't really that way anymore. Um, it's interesting. And people are getting a, a, a cold dose of reality as a result of that. So not to get too political, but a lot of people, myself included, assumed that uh, our next president was going to be uh, Kamala Harris. And certainly there were polls saying that and this and that saying that. And it looks like it was going in that direction. And it looked like the Democrats were going to be back in style. And to everyone's shock, that is not the case at all. It was basically a sweep by the Republicans, and, and Trump won uh, decisively. WWE Hall of Famer Donald Trump, he won decisively in that race. He is a two-time president now. Can't take it away from him. It is what it is. And I think that whole situation was a rebuke on our entire system because Donald Trump is not a regular politician and, and no matter how you slice it, it, it is what it is. He's something entirely different. He's his own classification, whether you like him or you don't like him. I believe that what we're going to experience over the next couple of years is a new awakening where people are going to stop this nonsense of holding others to a standard that they can't even hold themselves to. And here's what I mean by that. Devon Dudley just relayed exactly why he feels the way that he feels about the McMahon family. The house that he lives in today, that he raised his kids in and what have you. That family, by providing him with as many opportunities as he's had, and every single time Devon busted his butt, blood, sweat, and tears, he, he, he bled, he sweat, and he paid the price of a wrestling lifetime, as Ric Flair would say, right? He earned it. But that family provided those opportunities. It would be embarrassing. It would be such a scumbag thing to do, to have the audacity to talk down on that family, given the fact that you have been afforded the opportunity to earn so much and to do so much and to accomplish far more in your career than maybe you even thought you could, at least in the beginning. So I want everybody who's listening out there, it's okay. Those of us who, who, who can look at reality and be adults about things, it's okay to come out and, and stretch and, and, and let the world know you're here. We don't need to play these us versus them games and we don't need to pretend like our lives haven't been what they've been. You know, there is no reason for this man to talk down on that family. Of course, you can have your gripes, you could have your disagreements, but overall, they treated them right. And that's the end of it. So, Devon, I, I respect you even more 
for the fact that you're telling the truth the way that you are and you're not afraid to do so. And you've been consistent since since episode one. You've been consistent. You haven't allowed anyone to bully you off of telling the truth. No, they were good to me. They took care of me. Yeah, there may have been creative differences here. Yeah, I felt like I could have done more there. But overall, they were good to me. I respect you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that bothered me the most and why I was so vocal about it was because when I and I said this before on the show, when I made the comment about Stephanie, when I said I was infatuated with her, uh, as opposed to uh, what's the word? Not infatuated. What what was I saying? I should have said I. Um, uh, it'll come to me later, but it wasn't the word infatuated like I was in they, like they made it seem like I was in love with her. Like I wanted to be with her and so, and I'm like, no, that wasn't the case at all. Maybe it was the wrong choice of words, but that was not the case at all. And they took it out of content. And this is why I have a problem with some of the dirt sheet writers because they take things out of content that they shouldn't say. I respect Stephanie very much. Um, you know, never once would I ever cross that line with her. Um, you know, and never once would I ever want to disrespect Triple H. That's his wife for crying out loud, the mother of his kids. Why would I even want to attempt to say something or do something like that is beyond me. So why these sheet writers, dirt sheet writers decided they wanted to print that stuff was crazy. That's one of the reasons why, whether you want to say I'm infatu infatuated or admire, admire should have been the word um, about Stephanie McMahon, because she's been great to me. She didn't have to be, you know, Stephanie could have turned up her nose and walked the other way every time she saw me, but she didn't. She always greeted me with open arms. If my back was turned and I didn't see her come in, she would make it known. And hey, Devon, how you doing? I turn around. Oh, Steph, what's going on? It was stuff like that. That's when you know somebody's genuine. Let your back be turned and they still acknowledge you when they don't have to. And she's done that. And I've seen her do that not only with me, but with other people she's done that with, you know? So it's one of those things where... You know, I'll, I, like you said, I'll always be grateful for them from Vince all the way down. And, and you have every reason to be. And that's the most important thing. It's funny. I, I was, you know, part of doing this whole podcasting thing is that you have to build community. So, I mean, I, I have a a number of social media accounts that are related to the shows and, and I have a private wrestling group. So other fans, like almost like a focus group, really you know, things that they feel are important or talk about, what have you. Those are the things that generally make it on the show. Um, and I also, you know, check in on other groups just to see what people are talking about to stay current. And I was very surprised at different things. For instance, The Undertaker having Trump on his podcast and people having a problem with that. And, you know, it, it, it boggles my mind. Here you have a guy in Donald Trump who is a longtime investor in the WWE, who is in the WWE Hall of Fame, despite the fact that he's this billionaire and, and he's this, this mega personality, he's been a superstar pretty much our entire lives, Devon. Um, he's somebody who never had, I don't think he necessarily needed wrestling. So the fact that he always went out of his way to be associated with wrestling and, and really has helped wrestling, it doesn't make any sense for somebody like The Undertaker, who's been around as long as he has, to not embrace somebody like Donald Trump. Why wouldn't you? That's the guy you know. <laughs> that's the guy who, who's helped you make money. And that's the guy who has helped keep the company that kept the lights on for you and your family uh, relevant in his own way, using his star power to, to add to that. So it's, it's common sense. Forget about politics, folks. It's common sense. If you can't show loyalty to the people who have been there for you, I'm sorry. I have a problem with that, and, and I can't. I don't trust you, quite frankly. We don't have to agree politically. And I, and I make no bones about the fact that I don't necessarily agree with Trump and, and those folks politically. But I'm going to tell you this. Anyone who's supporting him, if you have that kind of history with him, I don't have a problem with that. I shrug my shoulders and I said, that's life. You better support your homeboy because he supported you. <laughs> so even when we're talking about the McMahon family and, and, and people can have their gripes and some are legit and some are made up, especially a lot of you fans, you make up your own issues to have with people. Um, when you hear these wrestlers tell these stories 
about how they were treated, especially in a positive manner, don't don't turn up your nose and act like a jerk. Because if you would turn your back on people who took care of you, then what is what kind of person are you on the inside? And I, I'll I'll leave it at that. You know, you know when I get on my soapbox, <laughs> Devon, folks got to watch out now. You know, you know that's one of the things that I always say. You sit there and you take care of somebody. You you watch them. You nurture them. You make sure they're good. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get a little taste of glory and they turn their back on you. And that's life. And that's how things go. But, you know, karma is a bitch and it pays you back in one way, shape or form. Don't start getting on your knees asking God why when you already know the reason why. And a lot of people don't think karma is real, but it is. It's very real. And, you know, I love the fact that it pays back people the way it does. It doesn't come on your time. It comes on its time. And everybody who has a bit of cup to drink from will drink from that cup one day. And when they do, they're going to have to realize it, that they made their own bed. So I could never, ever do that um, to somebody that's helped feed me and my family. Yeah. I mean, listen, like they say, man, you you either stand for something or you're going to fall for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and integrity matters. It, it, at least it does to me, and I know it, it matters to you. So that's that's good stuff. We'll probably get canceled for that that entire <laughs> that entire segment there. We'll probably get canceled for, but it'll be worth it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. Speaking of unbelievable, let's talk a little unbelievable here. Tony Khan has a quote that is trending, and folks are are, are writing entire think pieces about it because it's so ridiculous. Um, so I want to get your thoughts on this here, Devon. Tony Khan says, I really think most of the top black wrestlers in the world are now in AEW. So, so Tony Khan, I, I guess he, I don't know. It, 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 is he the savior now? Is he Moses leaving, leaving folks to the promised land? It, it, most. He didn't say some. He didn't say that, you know, I feel we have the best. He, he said, no, most of the top black wrestlers in the world are in AEW. What are your thoughts on that, Debo? <laughs> well, Tony Khan's done it again. <laughs> 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 That's all I got to say. He's done it again. Um, <sighs> you know, you get a couple in your company, and now you think you got all of them. He got them all. He got them all. <laughs> Somebody collected baseball cards. Somebody's got to know when to press that mute button over there. <laughs> Brother, they are rewriting history every every chance they get. And it's so ridiculous because we have the receipts. Tony Khan had to be forced. He had to be forced. He had to be shamed into hiring more black male wrestlers in particular. Right. He had to be shamed into doing it. And now suddenly he he's Moses. You know what I mean? He, he <laughs> hey, let my people go. That's who he is. He's a savior. It's ridiculous. I'm seeing I'm seeing reports from these these humanoids who are claiming exorbitant contract amounts that there's no way that they're true. Um, and I think it's dangerous. And I'm gonna call it out on the show. Saying things like, well, you know, uh, Shelton Benjamin is making $2.5 million in AEW. Now, let me tell you something. I hope that's true because I respect and appreciate Shelton Benjamin. I think that you, you are not going to find a finer wrestler on the planet than Shelton Benjamin. And I think that's a man who deserves, you know, all that life can offer him and then some. But there's no way on God's green earth he's making $2.5 million a year in any wrestling company, and if that's just a straight contract, we're not talking merchandise and incentives and anything else, straight money, he's making $2.5 million. If he's making that kind of money, then what are you paying Bobby Lashley? <laughs> are you paying him $20 million? Like, what? you know what I mean? This guy's a multi-time world champion and what have you. Like, come on, what are we talking about right now, guys? You know, but they, they plant these weird stories to try to make it seem like Tony Khan is doing so much and it matters so much. Well, I look at it a little differently. You're in a situation right now where you're making these claims that you're you're paying all these black wrestlers so much money and that you got all the black the best black wrestlers and what have you. 
And that coincides with the fact that you're having some of the worst ratings, not some of, you're having the worst ratings and you're having the worst attendance in company history. You better not, Tony Khan, you better not blame the increase of black wrestlers on your roster as the reason why your company's in the toilet. Because make no mistake about it, brother, a lot of this stuff that you're claiming and that you have your, your surrogates claiming is all foolishness. In reality, it's just your poor management that's killing that company. You know what I mean? So I, I look at it from a different perspective. Again, the whole political thing where you you got to look beyond what's in front of you. You're not going to blame our people for the fact that your company is, 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 is screwing up. Well, I gave them all this money and I brought them in, like you guys said. And look, it hurt the company. Don't play that game, Tony. And I'm on top of you. I'm listening to everything you say because I'm waiting for the day where you, you talk that nonsense. You know what I mean? Because I can see where it's coming. I don't know, Devon. Am I am I missing something here? What do you think? <laughs> well, like I said, he's done it again. <laughs> done it again. Um, he's done it again. You know, the one person I like to hear from from time to time, I'll go on his podcast and listen is Jim Cornette because he doesn't he doesn't hold anything back when it comes to AEW or Tony Khan. He just lets it rip, and I find it pretty much entertaining and amusing at times. Um, you know, because a lot of people are scared to say certain things or what have you, but Cornette is not afraid to say anything at all. And the guy he does the podcast with, Exit On. So, you know, look, I, man, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I, I just got to think, you know, he's got to, he's got to, he's got to stop somewhere. You know, he's got to stop. Um, you know, these comments aren't going to get him anywhere. And, you know, I mean, yes, you have some great African-American talent in your company that are great. The Hurt Business has really, <clears throat> are doing a really good job, you know, and this and that, and I'm glad you got guys like that in your company. Uh, but remember, there are so many other um, African-American stars that are out there in different country and different companies that you don't have yet. So you can't say most. I wouldn't even say most. I'd be skeptical to say some. You know, I think, again, you have to be very wise and very conscientious on how you use the words that you use sometimes because, you know, it'll be taken out of content, whether you mean it that way or not, it'll be taken a different way. And you can't blame anybody for getting on you for doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and especially when... You know, a guy like Tony, who has a history of just being very disingenuous about everything. Um, you, you marketed that company as going to be everything for everyone. You know, women are going to be paid equally and, and we're going to we're going to treat everybody. Everyone's going to have an equal opportunity to do everything. And, you know, we love the LGBTQ plus folks and blah, blah, blah. And then at every turn, you see it always falls short and it fa falls short by miles. And you start to ask yourself, are you just saying things like a politician, really? Are you just telling me what I want to hear, but then doing the complete opposite? And I'm sorry, there's a reason why the little bit of fans you had have literally run for the hills, brother. Because you just, you're not, you don't deliver on the things that you promise. And it sucks. And you can only treat the consumer a certain way for so long before they just stop showing up. You know what I mean? So just bear that in mind. But I I saw that comment and I see people, you know, trying to make excuses and what have you. And it's like, Tony Khan doesn't need a translator. He said what he said. <laughs> He's speaking English, folks. He said what he said. So we can we can hold him accountable for what comes out of his mouth. Um, and that's that. You know, Devon, the biggest thing that happened over the past, well, since we, we last recorded with each other, is the Mike Tyson jake paul match up there it was a boxing match on netflix first time netflix ever had a big event like that and it actually crashed netflix they were having streaming issues because so many people were, were logging in to watch this spectacle um in the end you know uh, jake paul won the match unanimous decision eight rounds two minute rounds so they were quick but eight rounds and I, I got to tell you, man, just like you, Devon, I, I grew up watching Mike Tyson. 
fortunate enough to have seen all of his fights on pay-per-view and, and what have you. Whatever that was in that ring, that wasn't Mike Tyson. Not because he couldn't do it, the guy in the ring couldn't do it, but it's because the guy in the ring refused to do it. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation. He made more money as the fight went on. You know, you, you got paid more if you if you made it to the next round, to the next round, to the next round. So, you know, Mike Tyson made over $20 million on that one fight, which congratulations to him and his family. Can't blame the guy for that. Um, Jake Paul made over $40 million. Wow, that kid knows how to make money. So congratulations to him, too. But that was a slap in the face for the sport of boxing, in my opinion. And I, you, can, you couldn't convince me that Mike Tyson can't beat the hell out of Jake Paul because we saw flashes there. And Mike was quick as a, as a, as a cat. So it's not like he couldn't do it. And the boy couldn't touch him if, if Mike didn't want him to touch him. So that was a fix, in my opinion. You saw the fight. What did you think, Diva? I definitely felt the fix was in. You know, you go from training, you go from watching Mike, the way he was training, and his movements and things like that. You saw that the first 30, maybe 40 seconds of the first round with Mike, but then after that, it just stopped. And there's no way you could sit there and tell me that the training that he was doing that we all saw leading up to that fight was not real. And there were certain instincts on social media where they show you where there was an opportunity where Mike could have hit him and he didn't. And, you know, 58 years old, I'm not going to buy that he's not that wit enough, doesn't that witty enough to know when to take the opportunity to, you know, do do that to somebody. I just I just can't buy it. I, the way that fight was and the way it looked, I, I cannot buy that that was the Mike Tyson we saw training up leading up to that fight and all of that. It was a totally different Mike Tyson. And you could tell the minute he walked out into that arena that he it wasn't the Mike of old. And when I say old, like even during the press conferences and things like that, you saw Mike the way he was. He was upbeat. He was gone. You didn't see that walk into the ring at all. You saw a Mike Tyson that was already defeated before he even got in that ring. And I just don't believe that that was Mike. I had a conversation with Booker T. Booker T actually thinks that it was legit. And I, and even though, you know, I can't out-talk Booker, <laughs> and I'm not going to try, but I think Booker knows a little bit more about boxing than me, but I'm sorry. There's no way in hell you can make me believe that 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 fight was not fixed. I, I I cannot believe that. There's no way after watching, like I said, him training, getting ready for this fight, and then to see what I saw, mm -mm, I don't buy it. I mean, we saw Mike's footwork in training, and even in the match, we saw Mike's footwork. So you know that, come on, guys, like this this is a man holding, and, and, and he never put his power on that boy. Like you said, we saw flashes here and there, but then Mike would tag him, and then he would make this face and bite his gloves and not follow up after he would tag him. And it's like he was doing everything in his power not to hurt that young man. And what I saw in that match, and we've seen it time and time again with, with Logan Paul, he's not a boxer. So I, I congratulate him on being smart enough to understand how to promote a fight and how to get people to spend money to watch whatever he's doing in the ring. But he's not a boxer, and that's why he's not going in the ring for the most. This is the first real boxer he was in the ring with. And, you know, Mike, even at his age, I think he could destroy this kid. But again, $20 million, what would you do for $20 million? It, 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 as much as Mike Tyson has given to sports and to pop culture, and as much as has been taken away from Mike Tyson, do I blame him? No. Nonetheless, I just don't like it. I don't like it. Uh, I grew up watching Mike Tyson. I know what he's capable of. And watching, I've seen all of Jake Paul's fights now and, and, and seeing what he can do. This guy, is a, he's the poorest excuse for a boxer I've ever seen. Like, it's just embarrassing that this guy calls himself a boxer because I don't see improvement on any level from anything that he does. And you could even, I don't even think he was... I feel like he might have been giving his best effort, which is scary because at his age and at Mike's age and, and as over the hill as Mike is, 
Jake Paul should have knocked him out if he was a boxer. And I don't necessarily think that Mike Tyson could beat the top boxers in the world right now. I'm not going to go that far because I don't, I don't think that's true. I think they would dust them off pretty, pretty well. Deontay Wilder and some of these guys, they would, they would hurt Mike. But Jake Paul could never hurt Mike. So it's just embarrassing that we even had to, to mention them in the same sentence. It's, it's kind of silly. But, hey, get your money. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it seems like with all the talk that's going on, you might see a Jake Paul, Mike Tyson, too. And if that's the case, I don't think Mike will follow the script. <laughs> Listen, he, at, at this point, you, you don't made $20 million. You might make another $20, $30 million on the second go-round. Just knock the boy out, please. Can, mm-hmm. can, can your last fight be you knocking some punk out? I would love it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on, Mike. Please, Mike. Just just give him give him the full shebang, please. You know? Again, so, you might see it if there is a two, but I don't know. I don't think there will be a two. Well well let me ask you this, Steve Vaughn. If if I pay you twenty million dollars, will you let me beat you in a match? Brother, I'll lay down in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, excuse me, you're not done whooping my ass. Please. <laughs> no, harder. Damn it, harder, I said. <laughs> Listen, remember the finger poke of doom with, with, with Kevin Nash and, and, and Hulk Hogan, where Hulk Hogan, what did he, he, he poked him with his finger and Nash laid down for him and, and Hogan beat him for the match. It'll be one of those situations, right? I'm laying my ass down so fast. <laughs> you couldn't get to your knees fast enough to count one, two, three with me. <laughs> We're just cutting up this week, boy. We're just cutting up. <laughs> D-Boy, let everybody know. What's the best way that they can reach you out there, brother? Yeah, sure. So you can reach me on Instagram at Testify Devon and also Twitter at Testify Devon. Inbox me. Do all of that good stuff. Love to hear from you. Love to talk to you. And again, don't forget, I got that detailing business. Uh, down in Fort Lauderdale. If you're in the Florida area, give us a call. All the information is on the Instagram um, <clears throat> uh, feed. Uh, just give us a call. We'll come detail your car. You have the Devon Dudley Academy right in Winter Park, about three minutes away from the Performance Center, right around the corner from Full Sail University. So come on down if you want to take your wrestling career to the next level and you feel like you're ready, give Devon Dudley Academy a call and we're right here. You can get that on Devon you can get that on Devon Dudley on on uh Twitter as well as Instagram. So hit us up and let us know if you're ready to become that next star. We also have my cigars that will be uh spread out throughout the United States and maybe even different countries. Well I'll definitely let you know when that's coming out, but you can hit me up on Instagram to find out if that's what you would want. We can send them to you. So let us know. And also um you know, we also have just a, a YouTube channel coming out. Uh, we've already did five episodes of it, so that's going to be coming up very shortly. I will let you guys know how that's going to work and when it's coming on and when you can catch it on YouTube. So, you know, Maven can't be the only one that's out there doing this stuff. <laughs> I know. Right? Maven done cracked the code, man, on, on how to do this YouTube thing. So the fact that the Devon Dudley uh, reality show, that's what I'm calling it for now. Uh, the fact that that's on the horizon is, is so cool. Again, 2024 has been awesome. 2025 is going to be even bigger for the Devon Dudley brand for sure. Uh, folks, as always, Duke Loves Wrestling on Facebook, on Twitter, Duke Loves Wrestling at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of the show, any questions that you have. As you can hear, Devon is as candid as can be. He doesn't hold anything back. He gives his honest opinion. Doesn't matter how these folks out there, they try to bully you into not telling the truth. We don't play that, okay? We do not play that. We're going to give it to you straight, no chaser, and that's the way it is. Uh, before we go there, Devon, we have a very special birthday this week. A brother down in New York, huge pro wrestling fan, very good dude, beloved by so many people, by the name of Knowledge Allah. What do you have to say to our brother, Knowledge Allah? Knowledge Allah, assalamu alaikum, my brother. Much peace be on to you. Happy birthday. Many more. And, you know, stay blessed, my brother. You know, Knowledge is a big fan of yours because uh, he has a little bit of crush on on uh, your friend Mercedes. So. <laughs> 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 so, uh, tell Devon putting a good word for me. I'm like, man, you better cut it out. That girl, <laughs> she would mess you up. You better cut it out. Listen. <laughs> uh, 
All right, Debo, it's that time. You, if you gave us, technically, you gave us a word of the week earlier, which was amazing, but, but let's see if you got one more in you. What's the word of the week this week, bro? Yeah, sure. When God gives you a new beginning, do not repeat old mistakes. Woo, testify. My brother. Strictly for the culture. Brothers and sisters, you have seen the T-shirts, the hats, the hoodies, the mugs in the hands of some of your favorite pro wrestling stars, podcasters, and influencers out there. And now it's time. Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca and you too can be part of the movement. Bigger than sweatshirts and commercial success, Strictly for the Culture aims to build with like-minded people and elevate their position in the world through knowledge, self-love, and desire to unite. So what are you waiting on? Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca. Do it for the love. Do it for the knowledge. Most importantly, folks, do it strictly for the culture. This is Tony Giovanni, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling. <laughs> 